Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the Dying Your Way podcast. Um, three years of podcasting, and we have had some really amazing guests on this podcast. And I have grown so much just talking about death and dying with so many different people from all over the world with unique perspectives on the topic. And um, because of that, I've grown so much, and I hope you as listeners have as well. Um, I'm very, (laughs) very unique perspective on death and dying today with a very, very special guest that I'm so honored to have, Sean Cunningham. And Sean Cunningham is a filmmaker, director, producer of so many films. He is coming to us from Los Angeles, but you will know him from um, the Friday 13th series of horror films. So he is... (laughs) really been in the death and dying industry, if you want to call it that, for a long time, but from a completely different point of view. Now, you may be wondering why I invited Sean to to talk with us today. It is because he's done this documentary called The Nurse with the Purple Hair. And I saw this documentary in 2017 in New York City, and it really affected how I approach my work as an end of life doula and in the services that I provide to people online, helping them sort through all the things we sort through. And there is just an undercurrent in this film of love, number one, but just dispelling the myths of hospice. And I have interviewed Michelle Lasoto, who is the nurse with the purple hair. But Sean is very much a part of this documentary and you see him throughout. And I just really sense that he transformed in his thoughts of death and dying as he would, as he was doing this film. I am just honored to have him here. I'm going to let him speak for himself. Certainly don't want to put words in his mouth. And I don't think I could. So without without further ado, here is coming to us from Los Angeles is Sean Cunningham. Hey, Sean. Hey, Claire. Nice to see you. Yeah. Well, I am just really honored to to have you with us today. Your audience might... Your audience might not know it, but I know you through not just the doula thing, but also through your sister. Six degrees of separation. It's just I one know. with us. It's amazing. <laughs> She's lovely. So, yeah, um, yeah I'm. Uh, I don't know if I if I saw you in New York in 2017 or not, but um, I know didn't. we didn't. You didn't. Oh, okay. I mean, it was an international doula seminar that was a. Gotcha. And really, the they started the seminar by showing your documentary, which immediately set the tone for what the rest of the uh, long weekend was going to be. Mm-hmm. And mm. yeah, so I, I talked on a lot in the introduction, and I probably said things that didn't fully represent you. But before we get into any of that, I would love to know how someone born in New York City that went to Stanford University that went to Hollywood and became really a famous film director in the horror genre. How did that happen? And then from that, why why the nurse with a purple hair? <laughs> well, it's, Lots a lot. That's a, you know, that's a, that's a long uh, kind of boring story. But um, you know, as a young man, I was uh, trying to figure out how to make a living, support my wife, my kids. And um, I had uh, started out in the theater and I made a transition from the theater to try to figure out how to make movies. And then I started to make little movies and one thing led to the next. And I got, um, ultimately, I got very lucky. And I think that, you know, you work hard, but you've got to be very lucky. So I I did all of that. And um, as a result, I had uh, the opportunity to do a lot of things in my life and and experience a lot of things in my life. And um, I personally, I've always had an affinity for um, documentary 
style filmmaking. And so that uh, there came a time when I met this this hospice worker, Michelle Lasota, who is the nurse with the purple hair. Yeah, now yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to make the assumption that, that the people who are listening to this know you, but they probably haven't connected with the movie, the nurse with the purple hair, because among other things, you're out of the country. And sometimes it's harder to get uh, stuff when you're out of the country than not. So anyway, I meet this nurse uh, at a horror convention a horror and convention. At a horror convention, <laughs> she was assigned to me to be my guide, and they call it a handler. And uh, and that was, that was their position, <laughs> right? I I was there, uh, you know, signing autographs and and shaking hands and stuff like that. But um, over the over the two or three days that we spent, you know, together, mostly day and night, I discovered that she was a hospice nurse and. Mm. Um, my, uh, my dad had, uh, died in the hospice in the Bronx in 1980. And that was my first, my first experience with hospice. And it just, um, I, I just became so aware of these wonderful people, I, but I only knew them with regard to my, my relationship with my dad and, and mm. their relationship with him. But with Michelle, I said, so talk to me about your job. I mean, why in the world are you doing this? You know, now, what? I mean, it's like you go to work every day and, and the people that you're trying to care for die and then you go do it again. You do it again. It would, it would drive me crazy. And she said, Sean, you just don't get it. You know, I don't go to work every day and try to try to uh, uh, do what I can't do. I go to work every day and I meet this people and these people and I say, how can we make today the best day possible? Mm. And that was such a completely different way of approaching death and dying and all the rest of it. And that became sort of like ground zero of my, of my understanding of so many of these people that that work in the in the field like yourself mm. and and um you know i learned uh one of her pet peeves is uh, so many so many uh, people in, in in the medical profession doctors and nurses and things they stay away from uh, they stay away from hospice they don't want to know about hospice and by and large the words often come up i'm sorry there's nothing more we can do for you. Yeah. And this makes people in the industry crazy because there's so much more that so, so much, much more care that, that gets extended. And, and so that you start to, when you look into it as I did and you start to meet these, these people, um, you realize that they're, they're just so helpful and compassionate and understanding and, 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 you know, and we, as a culture, we're just so, you know, oh, I can't stand the thought. I can't even say the word, d -d 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 -d, you know, <laughs> I, I can't say death. I can only say passing or mm. rainbow bridge or, you know, or something like that. And, yeah. and I, so I, through Michelle, uh, I met a whole bunch of her co-workers and, and I just said, these are people that the rest of us would really benefit by knowing more about who they are and what they do and what their attitude uh, towards life and death and dying is. And that's what, that's what drove me ahead to, uh, to try to figure out how to make this movie that would show them and, and try to honor them and what they do. And, and um, that's, that's, that's what, that's what drove the notion of the film. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think um, there's no way in a movie uh, that you can do much about telling somebody, well, this is how you die. And of course, none of us really know that. And if we're just watching somebody else die, then you're not really learning anything except getting crazy. And it it became, you know, that that families and, and workers and, and, and friends, we just don't have any tools 
you know, for dealing with um, the end of life for, for our friends and family and loved ones. And yeah, to, well, to, I, learn, to learn to embrace some of those tools and, and to learn to, to be able to be there for somebody who needs you. Um, I thought that was, I thought that was really important. I still think it's really important and it's become one of my, one of my, uh, my notions and, you know, taking this movie and trying to, uh, trying to make it be seen by as many people as possible, just as a yeah. way of you know, up the door. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's what I love about the movie is that it's so um, user friendly, but it, it really debunks so many myths that are out there about what hospice is and what hospice isn't through these interviews with people that are part of that hospice palliative team I mean yes it you know Michelle's just a, a very special person I mean we've she just really got to say that she's truly yeah. unique but the pe other people that were part of that team that you interviewed you know the the chaplain the social worker the medical practitioners I mean all of those people that are part of that palliative team wearing the hat that they wore or are wearing um, it really showed what is needed to die well. And I use that term with, you know, air quotes, yeah. but um, the, the palliative approach that is hospice care, I mean, palliative care can happen before you're ready for hospice, but um, that coming together in that film really it showed not only the best of hospice and what it is, if anything, it, it frustrated me that everybody doesn't know this. Everybody doesn't have access to it. I mean, this isn't something that, you know, yes, you need to be educated about death literacy, but you're in LA, you have access mm -hmm. to all of these things that are just so, um, you know, top notch in the medical field and you're educated and you know what to ask for, but your film, if it was widely available, would be just a wonderful way to teach death literacy. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's a way of getting started. I, I, um, again, if you haven't seen the film, you haven't experienced one of the, one of the peculiarities of it. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's not one of those movies that you should like and that it'll be good for you. You know, just Tuesday morning, if you have the energy, have your coffee, you know, you go in and you, you know, suffer through this and come away from it a better person. It isn't meant to be that. And I don't think it is that. And what I've discovered is people come in and they watch the movie, not knowing what to expect. They become in their own way seduced by the different people that they meet feel that they've learned something and, and felt something. But then at the end of the movie, you know, the lights come up and the people are in the room and these can be complete strangers. And for whatever reasons, they find a need to talk and mm. to talk about what they've just seen, to talk about their experience it comes from different points of view. But, but you know, the, the fact that, that you can at least start to talk about these issues that we aren't in our culture allowed to talk about, or we, we are mis so misinformed that when we do talk, we're often spreading misinformation. So um, I think that's the, the, one of the big values of the movie is that you learn something, but then you get to talk to other people in the same room about common experiences. And, mm. and um, I, I always just, um, I, I enjoy seeing that happen and, and feeling good to be a part of it. You know? and by the way, I'm a, I'm a hitchhiker. I came, I came and I watched these people do what they're doing. And I, you know, I would shudder to think of me trying to tell somebody else what they should do, but I got to, I got to see the way these other people with, with wisdom and compassion um, are able to live their lives and integrate yeah. these difficult things and, to be such a such a value to the people, not only the people who are, who are dying, but the people around them, teaching people how they can love somebody 
Well, even people that are in the industry that do this don't always do it at, at the highest level. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I work with a lot of, you know, clinicians and people that are trying to save people's lives. So they mm -hmm. really, and you mentioned it in the film, see death as a fail failure when death mm -hmm. is not a failure. It's anything but that. And I was, um, I had the DVD that I purchased in New York and I was uh, with my, uh, I was speaking at the Boston hospice where I uh, volunteer locally, but this was before I was volunteering, but um, I took the uh, DVD and showed it to all of the volunteers were gathered. And after they saw the, the movie, I really do feel like it, raise their level of awareness of a of a standard of care that we have not that they weren't doing a great standard but i'm just saying it you capture the quality that needs to be in a place where you're holding space for someone that's dying yeah. you know and even if you don't have access to to uh, a doula or to um you know good hospice care it is um you could see this film and you could support your loved one and know the the shift in attitude that might be needed in you when you're mm -hmm. supporting someone who is dying yeah. and it's just beautiful it really is beautiful mm -hmm. i wanted to also just comment briefly and whatever you think about this i was decades i lived in los angeles and um you know, there is something that is so age phobic about that town that mm -hmm. is unique mm -hmm. to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I am just wondering, you know, as we're getting older and and certainly um, <laughs> from my point of view, not as castable as but as um, as as we start looking at death, I mean, if you can't handle aging, how are the groups of people that you're around looking at death, their own death? Well, um, nobody wants to do that. And in fact, you know, I don't think we're wired to do that. We have to work at it mm -hmm. and and get exposed to different ways of thinking. I, you know, we're, um, I, 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 it's just a given. I don't. I mean, ageism is you know universal. There, there are all kinds of, all kinds of things that certainly in our culture, that um, people, young, uh, aggressive, successful people in their 30s, they don't want to work for their grandparents. They want to, you know, they want to, they want to make their own mark. And so that, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're always going to have um, uh, different, different opportunities and different ways of looking at the same thing. So I think that, um, I don't. I don't think that that's Los Angeles or even America. I think that's, in many ways, just our culture, Western culture, Western. doesn't embrace and doesn't teach, um, doesn't teach um, about the phenomenon of of people dying. We used to in this country through nineteen around nineteen fifty or you know, it, we used to have extended families that lived together, and the grandparents would live with the grandchildren or even the great grandchildren and, or, or at least in the neighborhood. <laughs> and yeah. And everybody would get to be part of, of the passing of somebody that they love. And it becomes a part, part of the journey and that you see that there are ways to handle these things. And, and I believe we probably had a better handle on it then than we do now. Now we just, if people start to get older sick, we just get them out of the house. I mean, that could be contagious. <laughs> you know, it's, mm. just, it's not in it. anyway. That's exciting. So, I want to ask you a question. Okay. So, how is it that you you are here interviewing me? But how did how is it that you <laughs> developed this this interest in end of life care and and its you know its contradictions and the uphill battle of trying to help people? Well. Thank you. It's fun to be interviewed by Sean Cunningham. Um, my parents both went south with their health at the same time. And um, it was, I was in a nonprofit uh, executive role in the Bay Area in California. And, and 
my other, my sister was like raising a child that was in high school. So it was just like one of us had to be there. And so I was the one that left California and went to uh, Texas to go back to take care of my family, not having any experience in elder care Mm -hmm. or anything. I had no experience, none, but I had this real can do like spirit that I'm going to Mm-hmm. get in there and save the day and you know I had no idea that it was going to turn into a six-year time wow. period of being the primary caregiver to my mother and my father and supporting them in death and dying and it was at the end of it I say I feel like I had a PhD in death and dying but that was in 2005 so to mm-hmm. 2000 and 10, 10, 2011, something like that. And um, hospice at that time, you, they were, the criteria was not as strict as it is now. And mm-hmm. my mother had Alzheimer's and she was on hospice for six years. And my father had all of his oars in the water. He had COPD, he had Parkinson's, he had pre- mystastic prostate oh. cancer. So it's like, I would look at mother who was very healthy, except for Alzheimer's. And my father who had this um, amazing, engaging mind, but he had so many physical issues to deal with. And I really wondered what was worse, you know? I mean, and it was a rhetorical mm-hmm. question in my head. I mean, who knows, but I was really committed to them dying at home and uh, both of them did die at home at the right time. And I was trained by hospice literally for all that time. So you were, I I was because they worked closely with me and we had a plan that, you know, when mother got to the terminal stages, she was coming home and you know one day they called me and she couldn't swallow anymore and she was conscious but you could tell she was at the at the end stages and you know two hours later there's a hospital bed in the living room and you know the family's coming in from California and everywhere so it's just like it was it was great and my dad even though you know his his went a little bit quicker two weeks before he died he was at a party you know, at the center of attention. So it's like, Mm -hmm. but when it came to a terminal condition, they both had very similar passings. And um, yeah, it it was a advocation that arose because people saw how mother and daddy died at home surrounded by loved ones, very peaceful passings for both of them. And they wanted to duplicate that for their family or friends. And I was happy to help. And after doing this for a while, I really didn't even know it had a name. And I Mm. ran across end of life doula. And I was like, well, that's what I'm doing. Mm. I I wanted to know what I didn't know if I was doing that. I wanted to be sure I was, you know, doing it at the very highest level. So I found a great mentor in Deanna Cochran, who was one of those early pioneers in establishing uh, an end of life doula as a, as a certified profession um, Mm -hmm. along with others. But um, yeah, I just studied with her for a year and became certified and then, you know, started traveling and with my husband and we had a, I was still working with people, um, you know, while I was traveling through Skype back in the day, But it was really, um, you know, these on ways like we're talking right now online that I was helping people. So we just developed our business around that. And I've been doing that even before COVID. And so when COVID hit, we were really well placed to support people just by using this kind of technology. Did that answer your question? Well, yeah. I mean, but so having been through it with your parents, um, you found that you had something that you wanted to share with others or that, you know, what drove you? Well, I mean, I, and you, you touched on this too. I mean, I think that if people knew the, the difference that hospice makes to having that good end of life, 
you know, having that kind of palliative team approach where you're getting psychosocial support, you're getting spiritual support, you're getting your symptoms managed, you're getting, you know, all of this team looking at you, not as a, a body that needs to be fixed, but a, a real person inside a sick body that needs a lot of support. And it it's just, the thing I learned as a doula is being able to identify transitions that everybody that has a progressive chronic illness will go through. Now you may be diagnosed with congestive heart failure, but you may mm -hmm. live for 20 years. And so it's like wanting to use metal, medical technology for as long as possible to live as well as possible. And then when the disease progresses, being able to identify that before the need is there and have whatever is likely going to be needed in place. And then the transition is really quite smooth and all of the, the pain and the anxiety and uh, the nausea, whatever, that can all be managed with good hospice care, with good symptom management. It's really addressing the um, suffering and the emotional issues that people have that you don't want to be doing that on a deathbed, you know? So mm -hmm. I, I work with people, you know, hopefully when they get their um, diagnosis and sometimes I work with them for years before they actually pass. Sometimes I work with them just a few days or weeks before they pass, but Boy, the people that, okay, this is what I want to say. The people okay. that are prepared have such a, a different experience of dying than the people that are not prepared. Not always, but generally speaking, that is the truth. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I am just motivated that everyone in this day and age should, should be able to have a pain-free, anxiety-free death you know, of their choosing. It's just possible, but you've got to be educated to know what to do. Yeah. Do you, do you find yourself working with the families a lot? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I because I'm doing it online, there's a whole piece when the, the person is actually dying, which we call vigiling, which, you know, I've, I can't be there because I could be in a different country, you know, from... Mm -hmm. who I'm talking to, but I can work with the family members and I um, have a training that I teach people, you know, how to do that themselves. So if you can't access a doula or if you don't know a doula, I can teach you how to do that piece, you know, through this death literacy training that we have and by working one-on-one -on -one with them. I mean, it's, it's very learnable. <laughs> How does the how does this skill of being a doula fit into the other mm, members of quote unquote the team? You know, mm, great question. No, I mean it's just a different it's a different level of care because even with a great palliative team, there will be gaps in service. I mean, as mm -hmm. the disease progresses, you'll you'll see the team come around um, more often. But still, it's really laying it on the family members and the friends, you know, whoever's supporting the dying person to somebody's mm -hmm. got to be there 24 seven. And so mm -hmm. it's just an extra layer, layer of service that is knowledgeable in end of life care to support the dying person. And, um, you know, it's a non-medical role. I mean, so there's no clinical things that we do, but we know you know, what to look for. And we know how to um, just techniques and options. And, you know, we, we can identify things again, hopefully before it happens. So the social workers in place, the, you know, you need to go on Medicaid. Well, let's get someone in here to, you know, get that me Medicaid paperwork done. A lot of it's very practical. Do you, do you find that, that the support for end-of-life care is different um, in Australia than it was in Texas? 
Okay. Oddly enough, yes and no. I mean, there's a different um, business model for end-of-life care in the United States, which I think is actually better than it is here. I mean, the medical care is free here. So it's like, Mm -hmm. that's great. But there there are a lot of um, people that have means in Australia basically like in Medicaid have to spend down their income or sell their house or to get the level of care that they need. And in the United States, because it's a, a, even if they're nonprofit, it's a for-profit model. So there is, um, it's just easier to get the care. There are more hospice um, entities in the um, United States and there because of the competitive model that's you know a for-profit would be you know they really try to do their very best and differentiate themselves from other hospices and stuff so you know people I encourage people I work with to do their due diligence to look at reviews to you know not just you know and to do it beforehand you know shop for because there's some great hospices out there and there's others that I really wouldn't recommend, so. Yeah. Um, so when would you like to get, in, if you had control of it, when would you like to start getting involved with uh, someone who's reaching um, the end of their of their time? I mean, a year in advance, a month in advance? Uh, it really, it really depends on, on I mean, I, I will talk to anybody free for Mm -hmm. a half hour and we can sort it out pretty quickly but um it depends on how much early planning they've already done you know so if if they have a diagnosis what is the prognosis how much time are we dealing with if they have um already done their will if they've already done named a power of attorney if they've already named a medical power of attorney if they've already done their advanced directive then you know you're in a pretty good position and then we can just sort through a lot of other things like um you know where do you want to die you know what do we need to put in place if you want to stay at home you know, finding out what your community resources are to um, support you to die at home if that's what you want to do. And I love to see that happen. I yeah. love yeah. I love to see people be able to be at home when they die and have a natural death. I mean, I've supported people that do the uh, medical aid in dying as well. You know, and that's a choice. But people hmm. for most part, for the most part, can have the ability to die naturally, very peacefully. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Unless they're in a Friday the 13th movie. and Yeah, then, then it's, it's it happens so <laughs> suddenly. They're really, there's really not a lot of room for death duelers in, in Friday none, the 13th. None, no, 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 no. I none. think there should be. Yeah. <laughs> We have to have we we'll have to reconsider that for the next. You know, but you you've really touched on in in the film and as we've been talking, the, how important it is to just have conversations. Yeah, and it's not just one conversation; it's many conversations that you have with your family and loved ones and the professionals that are supporting you. So, what? Okay, I'll get personal. What have you? What have you done? thinking about your end of life scenario um <laughs> oh gosh i don't know i it's, mean i think it, it, you're not I, getting you know, graded I, I, here i've had you know i've had uh, i've been fortunate enough you know to to have been exposed to things um you know like five wishes and and uh, the conversation project has an awful lot of stuff we can come back to that but i I think that they're enormously helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that the shared experience of of people like yourselves and Michelle and stuff like that is a lot of big problems happen because people in your immediate family don't know what you want, and and um, so that you know 
somebody gets sick and say, oh, no, he wouldn't want that. Or he told me he wanted this. And then there's all that other stuff that go, that's all of that anxiety around mm -hmm. just not having a plan. So I have a, um, you know, I have a, I guess, durable power of attorney for health care. Uh, and I have, you know, I've done a will and estate planning and that kind of stuff. It's, um, and I try to leave, uh, <laughs> try to think about, okay, if I die tomorrow, you know, do they know where the car keys are? <laughs> or, you know, or to that. Where are the passwords? <laughs> yeah, where are the passwords, right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I've done that, but then, then the, you sort of put that aside and then you come back to another day or whatever. And you say, Oh, I forgot, you know, and the peculiarity of what, I mean, I think that what I'm doing is um, by all measure sensible, but it's, but you just, you can start to think that by doing this, you're controlling the circumstances around your own death. And you, you know, man proposes, God disposes, and it's as simple as that. And, you know, it, but you know what you you do have control up to a point up to and, the point right. and then you have a great medical power of attorney or a proxy that will speak mm -hmm. on your behalf so you're not over medicalized and you're mm -hmm. not under medicalized mm -hmm. so that's being able to find that sweet spot where, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah and you just have to have a real it's if Anyone asked me what's the most important thing about, you know, having a, a good death, air quotes, it would be having a great medical power of attorney that is very available and a strong advocate for what you want. I can um, I can share with you something I thought was a really good idea. OK. Um, that, you know, you go back and forth. Well, who should be who should be this this medical proxy? Should it be my daughter or my wife or my best friend or my doctor, you know, and you can't, you go back and forth and around and around. And I uh, heard somebody say, all right, so let's say you got five people that you really love and trust. They're going to be, hopefully they're going to be around you when you die or going to, you know, so you try to get all of them together on, it could be a zoom call and say collectively, uh, this is what I want. This is what I'm planning to do. And if stuff comes up, you know, I want all of us to know what I would want. And then we, that lends itself to people asking questions, but you wind up saying it once to all five people. I would say it's five people. Mm -hmm. And then what you have is in the, in the power of attorney, you can have, you know, person one who, uh, can combine with person to to you know to do those responsibilities and if they can't agree then there's person three and then there's person four and or person five and what you have there is just a consensus because everybody knows what you said in the first place and everybody heard it in front of everybody else may i and make a suggestion sure well <clears throat> i wouldn't recommend that okay because when when dad's dying it's such an emotional event right. you know that no one's going to want to let you go and so your wishes may actually be difficult to be followed because of whatever circumstances are around it because of who's there who's not there i mean Right. If so, what we do in the training is literally we take people through 10 modules and they and at the end of it, the goal of the whole thing is to do an end of life plan. And right. but it's an informed end of life plan. I mean, because you've really thought through these different scenarios. Yeah. And then with that end of life plan that you've already established, then have that Zoom call and just say, yeah. here's here's the plan. It's with my will. So, uh -huh. and my medical power of attorney has a copy of it. My medical power of attorney is blah, blah. And the secondary, secondary is blah, blah, if they are mm -hmm. not for some reason able to. But that only kicks in if dad can't talk. I have right. full capacity and able to speak for myself. And, you know, I may say this, but, you know, 
two days later, I may say, say something else. If I have capacity, that's what it is. You always are in charge. Yeah, I think that all I was suggesting is that that for the people that you love, that they know what your plan is, that mm-hmm. you, you know, if you've, if you've been fortunate enough to have somebody that can walk you through, like you say, a 10 point, the 10 point plan, um, or so that you know kind of ha- how it's supposed to work out and <clears throat> and somebody else isn't stuck with in the middle of this enormously emotional, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> situation, um, be trying to service more than one master. And yeah. I, so I think we, I think we agree. I think it's just bring, you know, it's another, it was a way of just saying, Bring the family and bring the loved ones into whatever you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Is. And, and um, you know, uh, there's lots and lots of different ways that you can work it out legally. But it's it's like everybody knowing what you want subtracts yeah. subtracts um, uh, those. Um, I don't know those. Uh, weird question marks i mean at least that's what that's you know that's as i I look at it that seems like it would help i think many families have dynamics that are sort of vaguely hard to put a, a, a finger on to name that that could possibly be an issue when it comes to the end of your life and you know i think we love we love our family and we want to, you know, and they love you. You just want to be sure that whatever your preferences are, you know, that they are honored at the end of life and you will not you, you, but plural, you will be lifting a burden from them. If you Mm -hmm. have gone to this effort, so they don't have to make those di- difficult right. decisions. Yeah, that's, I, the point. And that's why I felt so relieved when I decided on a Viking funeral. Okay. <laughs> and how, how does that look? I'm just curious. <clears throat> well, you know, I think it starts with, the, you know, with the big wooden boat and the, and the pyre <laughs> and then you go out to sea. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's sort of supplemented with a fireworks display. I love it. And, um, and uh I, I I just think that that's just a nice, gentle way to do it. <laughs> yeah, and it needs to be filmed by someone who's really good. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, I, but today with the world of, of all these drones that we can have, I think it, oh, we can yeah. have, we can, we could certainly cover it well anyway. that's I love it. Uh, uh, Sean, I, I'm just so grateful for your time, and I am just very um, thankful that, you did the film, you know, because it really at a very beginning part of what it is that I do, I saw that. And on so many levels, it just really showed me this is how I want to do it. I'm, and I'm thrilled that, mm. that you felt that way. And I hope, um, I hope, you know, what we want to do is get as many people as we can to watch the movie. It's not an end all thing, but it's a way of opening up the door to have the kind of conversations you and I are having right now. Um, and it's, I think that's, that's the value. And so, and I just hope that, hope that uh, by doing this, we can, you know, pass it on to a few more people. We'll then pass it on to a few more people. It and, has that ripple yeah. effect. It does. Yeah, it, and uh, the more that people see and are actually with someone who's dying and see a good death, that fear for them is lifted Mm -hmm. and it just talk about a ripple effect. I think if we brought death home, you know, and, and um, not necessarily in the home, but brought death back to um, the sacred event that it really is, you know, it would just take so much of the fear away of, of dying Mm -hmm. and the stigma and the air quotes failure of dying. Um, Now for the people that are listening if you if you go to www.thenursewiththepurplehair.com, right? Is that correct? Right. And we'll have the link below. That is the best place to go to actually 
see this film and um, there are different ways you can get it. If you want to get a hard copy or if you want to stream it, or if you want to, there are different ways to do it. And can I just say, it's really generous that you've set yeah. it up that way, because really there is no barrier <laughs> to watching this film. If you go to that website and I encourage everybody to do that. And, and I think you can go to Amazon and get it as well. And um Sean, thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me, and I and I appreciate all the uh, all that you are doing, and it's mm. it's people like you that uh, that give people like me comfort and and hope. Yeah. So, well, you're yeah. a good one, and I'm just I'm just really delighted to meet you, and and, if, and I you, Claire. And if you see Beth before I do, tell her hi. <laughs> I I'm sure I will. I will. I will. And, and if you're if you're back visiting, then you, of course you have to come over. Oh, I would love to. I would love oh. to. Okay, take care. All right, take care. Bye bye. Bye.